we're in a series called Baggage. We've been in a series called Baggage the last few weeks, and really what we're talking about is really unpacking things in our lives that we carry with us throughout our lives that we don't realize are hindering us or harming us. And so we've been talking this through and we get our text from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse one. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight. Let us strip off every weight, all the baggage or lay aside, one translation says, all the weight, all the baggage that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Because of the joy, of the joy awaiting him, that's you and I, relationship with us, awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He took this shameful death on the cross for you and I because he knew the joy of on the other side. And then now the scripture says that now he is seated in heaven. He's alive. He rose again. He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And so we've been talking about baggage and we're talking about kind of removing baggage and what does that look like and lay aside those baggage and strip off that baggage. And today I want to talk to you about the baggage of religion, about removing the baggage of religion. Now you may say, somebody may have told you, hey, what religion are you? Or hey, I'm this religion. What religion are you? And that's not really in the context of what we're talking about when we say religion. What we mean by religion is all throughout the scripture in the New Testament, there were these religious leaders, these Pharisees and these Sadducees, these leaders who were demanding to live a certain way in order to get to God. And Jesus came to completely just demolish that. And he wanted to show everybody that it's not about religion. It's not about doing something, but it's about relationship. It's about understanding he is the one that did it all for us, amen? And so I wanna talk to you a little bit about that from the text um, in John chapter 21. What's happening here is Jesus had already risen. Um, He had died on the cross and he had risen and they had not seen him yet. And here's what happens with Simon Peter. The scripture says that he decided to go fishing. If you don't know Simon Peter, before he started following Jesus, he was one of the disciples. He decided before that he he was a fisherman. He fished all the time. Jesus called him and said, hey, would you follow me and be a fisher of men? He follows Jesus for three years. Jesus dies. And then when this is happening, before he sees Jesus again, he says, I'm going fishing. He goes back to the old routine of what he used to do. And the disciples said, we'll come too. And so they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. And so Jesus meets them on the beach and they couldn't see who he was. The Bible says they had fished all night. They caught nothing. Jesus calls to them and says, cast your nets to the other side. They cast their nets on the other side. They catch all this fish and they catch catch so many fish that Peter realizes it's Jesus. The Bible says he jumps out the boat and swims back to shore to be with Jesus. The Bible says when the disciples get to the shore, Jesus is on the shore with a fire making breakfast for them. He's showing us a picture of relationship. He had died, he had rose again. And Peter, it's interesting that just before this, few days before this, Peter had denied Jesus three times. He had told him, he told people, he doesn't know him, he doesn't know him three different times. And then right here, the scripture picks up where Jesus is meeting them and he's, he's literally feeding them. And this is where we pick up in the story. It says, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Come on, somebody, guys, feelings hurt. He said he was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter here is in the process of where he's working through things of not, have, not seeing Jesus rise. He, he, Jesus dies. He decides he's going to go back. He denies Jesus three times. He goes back to his old life, and Jesus meets him here. And it's interesting because Jesus doesn't, when he's meeting with him, Jesus doesn't say anything about denying him. Jesus doesn't say, I can't believe you. Jesus says, what, are you, what were you thinking? How could you make that mistake? No, in fact, Jesus just begins to show relationship with him and how he desired to meet him 
where he was. We see this all throughout the scripture in the life of Jesus, how he meets people where they are. And you may be wondering why in the world does this guy have a very colorful seesaw on the stage? I'm glad you asked. I want to show you a scripture here in John chapter 1 and verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among, among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Isn't it interesting? It doesn't say 50% grace, 50% truth. Isn't it interesting it doesn't say 70% grace, 30% truth? Isn't it interesting it doesn't say 80% grace, 20% truth? Isn't it interesting that he says full of grace and truth? Why? Because he wants us to understand that oftentimes this is what religion will do. Religion will cause us to live an unhealthy, unbalanced life on grace and truth. Let me explain. So we can get into the place of where, as Peter was, where we can feel like, you know what, we've made mistakes. We've, we've gotten to the place where maybe we, we, we're not where we want to be spiritually. We're not where we want to be of, uh, in our relationship with God. And so we kind of just, we kind of just shrink back. And I love this because Jesus, he, he says right here in the scripture, it says Simon Peter was going fishing. And the Bible says that Jesus is there on the shore. What does this show us? It shows us the picture of how Jesus wants to build relationship with us, but he wants us to know that you belong. He wants us to know that I belong, that we belong, that we are not, too, that we are not, uh, not bad enough or we're not, we're not so bad off or we're not have, we don't have too many mistakes where we can't get to God. We're not trying to get to God. We can't get to God. In fact, that's why Jesus came to us. He meets us where we are. But with the balance of grace and truth, here's what can happen. We can say, you know what? Well, you belong. You belong. Jesus loves you. And we can go grace, 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 grace. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Oh, you belong. Jesus loves you so much. Oh, Jesus loves you so much. Oh, you're just so great. Just Jesus loves you. And that's it. And we can stop it. Jesus loves us. But then what happens is that we can be unbalanced because of, uh, of understand, not understanding there's not just grace, but there's also truth. Or we can be on the other side of things where we can get, we can get so truth oriented where you got to do all these things the way God wants you to do them. And you got to obey and you got to follow and you got you to be good enough. And you got you to make sure you're doing the right thing and follow the rules that here's what happens. We become mean at thinking that we're better than someone else. We think that we're, we, we, we're, we're more spiritual than someone else because we go to church and then we're, we're outbalanced out, out and unhealthy in our truth. And this is why Jesus came. He wanted to show us relationship. This is what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees, they had all these rules to lined up in order for you to be able to follow God. And Jesus comes and says, no, I want you to know I'm full of grace and truth, not just truth, not just grace, but both. My wife is uh, Ashley, she is huge, big into the Enneagram personality test. Many of you in the room probably know what the Enneagram personality test. If you don't, I promise you somebody sitting next to you really does, okay? Somebody in the room, like they know all the numbers. If you don't know what it is, let me explain. It's a personality text, test, you take it, and they give you a number. You're a number. You can be a one, you can be a two, you can be a three, you can be a four, you can be a five. Well, these people, let me just tell you, that are really into it, they'll talk in language with the numbers. Let me explain. They'll say things like, oh, yeah, he's responding like that because he's a two. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, she said that. <laughs> She's such a four. Uh, what? <laughs> And then not only that, not only do they have numbers, and many of you know this, those that are in the room that you take it or online, you, you know the test. Uh, they also have wings. You're not just a number, but you're like a number four with a wing eight. Or you're a number two with the wing seven. And some of y'all in the room are like, mm, see, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You can't be a two with a wing seven. Uh, he doesn't even know. But here's what's interesting. In this personality test, they give you a number and they tell you what your life, how your personality is if you're healthy. Then they tell you if you're unhealthy, it gives you things that you do, how you respond negatively because you're an unhealthy too. So somebody says something negative towards somebody and they'll say, oh yeah, that's just because they're an unhealthy eight. <laughs> Don't worry about that. It's just an unhealthy eight. Or they're like, oh, she's a four, he's a five, mm, not going to work. And so here's what it is. Here's what it is. I just heard, literally, I heard somebody say, seriously, that's not going to work. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I literally just threw those numbers out there. Okay, praise God. Anyways, that being said. Here's the thing. We respond negatively because we're unhealthy. It's the same thing as I was thinking about this message and I was praying over this. It's the same thing spiritually. That if we're unhealthy on the side of grace, 
or unhealthy on the side of truth. Here's what happens. We end up responding negatively to people around us and then people think, what in the world is going on? Let me explain, like I just said. We can be all truth and say, oh, it's supposed to be this way and they have to follow this rule, these rules and they have to do these things and they have to believe this thing. And then here's what happens. We get so overwhelmed with, with truth that we become mean. We negatively respond to the world. Or we're on the other side of things where we're all grace and we're like, oh, you know, well, just let people, just love people where they are. And that's true. And Jesus just loves them. And I'm just, I'm a little skinny here. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, good. Okay, and here's what it is. Okay, it's all good. I need, I need to work out. I know, I'm sorry. Okay, here's what it is. And we can get so grace oriented where, oh, just let everybody be who they want. Oh, it's just let them be who they want. We're so grace oriented. Then we respond wrongly where we become carnal. And there's no lifestyle of being set apart and living holy. And so that's why the balance of grace and truth is so important. And this is what Jesus did. He came to destroy religion because it was such off balance of what God was wanting us and how he was desiring for us to live. And he shows Peter this. He meets Peter and he says, I want you to know you belong. He meets Peter in his distance from denying Jesus and his, his distancing himself and going back to being a fisherman. He meets him where he was. All throughout the resurrection story, I love it, Jesus is meeting with people and he meets people where they are. He meets Mary at the tomb. She's crying in despair. And he meets her where she is and he says, I want you to know. How he says, why are you crying? She says, because the Savior has died and he reveals himself to her. And the Bible says she's filled with joy. He meets her in her despair. We see the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're, they're frustrated and sad. They're talking about Jesus, how he died with one another. And Jesus is asking them, why are you, what's going on? And they say, we had hoped that this Jesus was the Messiah. He meets them and they're disappointed. They were disappointed in that moment. I want you to know Jesus meets you in your disappointment. You may have gone through a disappointment relationally. You may go through a disappointment with a church or with God or, or, with, or with a friend or whatever it may be. I want you to know God meets us in our disappointment. Why? Because he wants us to know that we belong. We see Thomas, the man, his name is literally nicknamed Doubting Thomas. What a terrible nickname. Come on, somebody. Like for the rest of history, you will be known as Doubting Thomas. And the man says that the disciple, the Bible says the disciples meet with Jesus and they see him and they're all excited and they tell Thomas and Thomas says, I can't believe it. I have to see him for myself. The Bible says that Jesus meets Thomas where he is. Jesus comes to him and he says, I want you to see me. He, wants, he said, put your hands in my, in my, on my hands. I want you to, to see my side. Why? Because he wants to meet Thomas in his doubt. It's all throughout the scripture we see how Jesus meets us where we are. See, oftentimes religion will say we have to get better in order for Jesus to meet us. I've heard people tell me. I'm like, hey man, you should come check out church. It's pretty cool. They got a cool pastor. That's a joke. And I'm like, hey, you should check it out. And they're like, oh man, yeah, I'd love to go back to church, man. I'm gonna I'm check it out. I'm gonna come back to church, but I'm gonna I gotta, I gotta work some things out first. Oh, you know what? I'd love to check out church. Hey, but you know what? I got this relationship thing going on. I gotta figure out this relationship thing. And then once I figure out the relationship thing, yeah, maybe I'll try. You know what? I, I'd love to go to church, but you know, I gotta get some things cleaned up. I gotta get my mind right. And then, you know, then I'll, I'll, I'll come back maybe to church. I don't go to the gym if I wanna gain 20 pounds or lose 20 pounds. I don't start and say, you know what? I wanna gain 20 pounds, and then, or I wanna lose 20 pounds. And then I gain 20 pounds or lose 20 pounds and then join the gym. That would defeat the purpose of the gym. It's the same thing with Jesus. See, oftentimes we think we gotta be better to get to Jesus when we, de we are defeating the purpose of why he came and rose again. It's because he loves us so much, he wants to meet us where we are. We don't have to get better. You may feel so far from God right now in this room or online. You may feel like you've made so many mistakes you could never reach him or he could never reach you. I wanna encourage you. I wanna challenge you. I, wanna, I just wanna let you know I'm excited to tell you, listen, God is a God. He meets you right where you are. Oh, I'm doubting. I'm struggling. I don't know. Let me tell you something. He meets you in your doubt. Why? Because this is what he wants us to know. He comes to destroy religion. Religion says you gotta get better. You gotta clean it up. You gotta act right. You gotta do these things first and then God will love you. Then you'll be welcome to a church. No, God is a God that loves us so much that he meets us right where we are in our baggage, in our, in our sin, in our shame, in our guilt, 
in our, in our doubt, whatever it is, in our insecurities and fears, he meets us where we are. All throughout the scripture, all throughout the scripture, Jesus is meeting with people that people would call sinners. All throughout the scripture, in fact, religious leaders and church folk is what we would call them in today's world. Church folk would be upset with Jesus, frustrated with Jesus, because he was meeting with them. In fact, the scripture even says they were notorious sinners. So they weren't like just like sinners, they were like sinner sinners. You know what I'm saying? They were like the ones like, whoo, whoo, sinners, you know what I'm saying? And Jesus wasn't coming to them and saying, you got to get right in order for me to be with you and let you know that I love you. No, Jesus was spending time with them. And the church folk were like, how could he do this? Why was he doing this? He was doing this because he wanted us to see the picture of his heart that he loves us and he meets us where we are. This is the God that we serve. And it's because he rose, because he's alive. Now we celebrate that he's alive. Why? Because we know now because he's alive, he can meet us where we are. If he was dead and still in the grave, guess what? We wouldn't be able to meet, he wouldn't be able to meet us where we are. But because he's alive, now he can meet us right in our mess, right in our baggage. And he allows us to let, him, let us know that he loves us and he cares for us. It's vital that we understand this as we continue to walk through the process of removing religion in our lives. John chapter 21 and verse 15, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He wants first Peter to know that he belongs, but then he doesn't stop at just belonging. He says, Simon Peter, do you love me? He asks him three times and Peter three times gives him the same answer. He says, of course, you know I love you. What does this show us? It shows us a picture. Okay, I want you to belong, but then after you belong, I need you to know that you love, but then I need you to go a step further than that and I need you to begin to believe. I want you to believe in me. We see it with Thomas in John chapter 20 and verse 26. It says a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them through the door. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he says. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out for your hand, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. See, Jesus meets us where we are, but he doesn't just want us just to meet, meet us where we are. He then wants us to see him and reveal himself to us in our mess. See, here's what happens. If we're not careful, we can say, oh yeah, see, that's the truth. That's the grace. God loves us. Yes, grace, grace, grace. Yes, he loves us. He, he, he meets us where we are, but then it goes a step further. Now we need some truth. And the truth is now, okay, now I need to start to believe in him. I can't just belong. I can't just say I want to sit around and belong. No, I got to know God desires for me to start believing in him. And then here's what happens. As we believe in him and as we see him, we start to say, okay, I see his goodness. He, he meets us in our mess and we say, okay, we see that he loves us and we begin to believe in him. I want to show it to you. What do we believe in? John chapter one and verse 29 says the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We believe the God that we serve, that he removes all sin. The Bible says that he bore, in 1 Peter chapter two, he bore our sin. He took, it, he took the penalty of what we deserved and he said, you know what, why? Because I love him and we believe this, he erases sin. See, we believe in him not just because we wanna feel good about ourselves. No, we believe in him because we know he loves us. He meets us in our baggage, in our sin, but then it doesn't stop there. He begins to erase that when we believe in him. The Bible says in John chapter three and verse 16, we all know this scripture, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. It doesn't say for God so loved the world that he gave his only son for whoever belongs in him will have everlasting life. If I would have quoted it like that, you would have been first one to say, no, 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 I know the scripture. No, I know the scripture. No, 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 no. Okay, and you say that's not it, why? Because we know the scripture says we must believe in him and this is where grace, grace and truth balances. Yes, we belong, absolutely, he loves you, absolutely, in your mess, absolutely. There's nothing you can do to earn his love, there's nothing you can do to deserve his love, there's nothing you can do to equal up to his love. He loves you exactly where you are, absolutely. But then, he doesn't want us just to stop at belong, he wants us to then to begin to believe, why? Because he knows if we believe in him, he gives us eternal life, he erases is the sin he removes the baggage but it must be where we get to the place where we believe in him and this is the grace and the truth of God a few months ago we were 
out and we went axe throwing. I don't know if y'all have ever done axe throwing, but you know, it's a lot harder than it looks, okay? And I went axe throwing. I'm, I feel like I'm somewhat of a coordinated person, so no kidding. I was like, I'm about to throw bullseyes all night long. I was like, y'all get out my way. Y'all about to see bullseyes all night long. For an hour straight, I threw it at the thing. I could not even get the thing to stick in the wood. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Much less hit the bullseye. Couldn't get it to stick in the wood. I mean, I kept throwing it. It kept clanking. I kept throwing it. It kept clanking. It. I kept, cl- I mean, it was terrible. I was so frustrated. So frustrated. No kidding. About two bays down, there's this guy. I think he worked there. He should have worked there. If not, he needs to be sponsored by the place. And this guy, I'm not kidding with you, he's like throwing it behind his back. He's, not, he's like closing his eyes, not looking. He's got two of them. He's like, <laughs> and he's hitting bullseyes all day. I'm like, this dude needs to be spot. This dude needs to be on TV. I, I'm no, no joke. One time he throws it behind his back, and that mug, hit, uh, he, hit the, he hit the bullseye. I was like, what in the world? I got so frustrated that I couldn't even hit it. I wasn't good enough to even hit the thing, and this guy's not even looking. He's just slapping it. I got so frustrated, I was like, I'm quitting. I ain't playing this thing anymore. I'm, I'm out of here. Let's go. And as I was studying for this message, God reminded me of this story. And oftentimes, this is how we are with Christianity. Oftentimes, we come in and we see people. We come into a church and we see people, they, they're looking nice. and They look like they got their lives together and they're smiling and they're happy and they're shaking people's hands and they're almost telling me hello too many times. I just want to slap somebody in the face, like leave me alone. I'm just trying to sit like my friend invited me. I don't even want to be here. And like all these people are so nice and like, and and then they're, they're singing real loud and they know when to amen, they're dressed nice. Like they got it all together. Man, these are good people. But here's what happens. We can come in with that picture or that concept and then we come in and then people say, you know, oh, well, they're so good. Now what happens to us? I'm just frustrated. I'm just working through some anxiety and I'm just working through an addiction. I, I got depression and, and I, I can't, I don't know if I can equal up to how good these people are. And so here's what happens. Then we say, I don't know if this is for me because all these people are so together. And that's religion. Religion says we have it all together. Religion says that we look all nice. But here, I want to let you know, here at Experience Church, we're, we are filled with a bunch of people that all know that we are all broken, that none of us have it together. We know that we are never good enough to be good. We are never good enough to equal up to God. We are never good enough to be considered holy or set apart. We know this one thing, and this is what we believe and stand on, and that is that we are not good enough. We never will be, but he is. And this is what we do. This is why we believe. It's not because I'm trying to equal up and be, I'm trying to look all nice. No, that we know we're broken and we're in need of a savior and we're in need of someone that can help us because this is the deal. This is why we believe because we know without him, we will remain stuck in our baggage. We'll remain stuck in whatever it is that we're struggling through. But because he died, because he rose, now he can meet us there, but not just leave us there. He meets us there and he can remove that off of our lives. And all we have to do is believe. We don't have to do a bunch, of, a bunch of prayers. We don't have to read our Bible throughout every single day for the rest of our lives. We don't, we don't have to make sure that we're in every small group. We don't have to make sure that we, we're at, at work and making sure that we're talking about Jesus in every five seconds. We don't have to do any of those things. Here's what we have to do. Just believe. All we have to do is believe that we belong, that we understand the concept that he loves us and he desires to build relationship with us. And then from building relationship with us, as we get around him, we see his goodness and we say, man, we wanna believe in this God. And as we believe in this God, here's what he does. He removes the sin, he removes the baggage. And not only that, he gives us eternal life. This is the God that we serve. This is why we believe. And I wrote this down. It's pointless to have access to forgiveness if we don't think about or excuse me, it's pointless to have access to forgiveness if we don't think that we need forgiveness. It's pointless to have access to forgiveness if we don't think that we need forgiveness. And this is where over grace comes. Over grace is I can just belong, I'm good, I'm good the way I am, I'll be fine, I'm gonna work it out myself, I'll figure things out, I'm I'm straight, I'm gonna be okay, I got it, I'll take care of it, I'll make sure I work through my baggage myself and we get stuck because we think we don't need him. And that's where the unbalance of grace comes. The truth is this, we know, we believe in him because we know he's the only one that can remove our sins. 
He's the only one that can give us everlasting life. He's the only one that can truly set us free. He's the only one that can give us life and life more abundant. He is, and it's because he's alive. And so that's why we celebrate. John chapter 21, verse 15, very quickly, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you say. he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take, my sheep, take care of my sheep. Third time he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you, Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, the process I believe that God came to destroy religion was with this, we belong, we believe, and then we become. See, here's what's interesting. Jesus, Peter, excuse me, denies Jesus three times. Isn't it interesting that Jesus then asks him three times to feed his sheep? He doesn't say, you messed up. He doesn't say, you're not good enough. He doesn't say, you can't do it. He doesn't say, I can't believe you. Here's what he does. He says, I want you to go and I want you to understand I've erased your past. Now I'm giving you a new plan. See, this is the grace of God. He doesn't just erase our sins and erase our past. He now gives us a new plan. The Bible says we become new creations in him. We become new creations, meaning this, my old life is gone and now I become who God has created me and called me to be. This is the grace of God. See, I love this because Peter here, he deserved, any, if anything, he deserved to be condemned. And I love Jesus because even in Peter's unfaithfulness, Jesus was still faithful. Even in our unfaithfulness, even when we don't get it right, even when we miss the mark, and even when we yell at our spouses and we make a mistake, or even when we, we, we make that b- bad business decision, or even when we make that decision behind closed doors we shouldn't have done, even in our unfaithfulness, he is so good that he still remains faithful to us. But it doesn't stop there. I love it. Jesus doesn't just meet us where we are to leave us where we are. He meets us where we are to give us a new life for where he's called us to go. And so this is what it is. We become like him. We become more like him. And we begin to say, you know what? It's not I got to behave and I got to do all these rules. No, it's like when you're married. For those that are married, when when you get married, you're not like, oh, man, I have all these rules now because I'm married. I got so many, there's so many rules. I can't do this and I got to do this and I can't. No, when we're married, here's what it is. Because you love your spouse, you desire to become a better husband or a better wife. Why? Because you love them. It's the same thing with God. It's not I have to behave and follow all these rules. No, it's as I see his love, I begin to believe in him. And from believing in him, I want to love him back and I want to give him my life. And I want to be, become who he's calling me and created me to be. This is the process that I believe Jesus came. We oftentimes, we say, man, we sing songs like Waymaker. If you've been in church any sort of time in the last two years, you know the song Waymaker. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise. I'm going to start rapping like my boy up here. You know what I'm saying? But oftentimes, and this is where the unhealthy grace comes, where, oh, yeah, I I just want to, I want the Waymaker. I need him to provide for me. And, oh, I need him to take care of me. Oh, I'm single. And, oh, I want my spouse. I want my honey boo-boo. Come on, somebody. I'm looking. I'm praying. Oh, I need that promotion. And so what happens is, oh, God, we need the way maker. But here's where it stops. We just pray for the way maker when Jesus is saying, here's what I need you to do. I need you to believe, yes, for the way maker. But I need you to also follow the way that I'm calling you to live. And this is what it is. Oftentimes we stop in our Christian faith and we say, oh, way maker, way maker. No, but here's the question we must ask ourselves. Yes, we want to belong. Yes, we want to believe, but it doesn't stop there. Then it's saying, God, I want to follow your way with my life. Why? Because I see what you gave up for me and there's nothing I could ever do to earn what you did for me. So I want to turn back and I want to give my life to you. This is the heart. God, I believe, when Jesus came. And you know, religion, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, really was, it was the exact opposite. Jesus came to show us that we belong, we believe, and then we become. But religious leaders, it was the exact opposite. It was first 
you got to become. I need you to get some things right in your life. I need you to fix yourself up. They had all these rules and regulations and from following all the rules and regulations, you got all that down. Okay, now you're proving to us that you believe. And so since you're proving to us that you believe because you've been behaving for however many years, now you're showing that you believe. Now we'll let you belong and call you a Christian or a believer or a follower, whatever you want to call yourself. And this is what they did. They had a completely opposite of what Jesus came to do. And he came to show us it's not about becoming, believing, and then, and then, uh, and then belonging. But it's first, I want, to, I want you to know you belong. That you're loved, that you're cared for wherever you're walking through, wherever you are in life. You're loved and he, won't, he wants to meet you right where you are. And then from seeing his goodness, we believe. And then from believing, we desire to walk and follow his way and become who he's called us to be. Here at Experience Church, maybe this is your first time. I'm glad you're here. But we believe this. This is what we live. We live this, that you, 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 there is always a seat for you here. We don't care what you look like. We don't care what you sound like. We don't care what your background is. We don't care if you smell good or smell bad. We don't care how much money you make. We don't even care what you believe. In fact, I tell people all the time, you can sit in our church, in our, in our, in our seats for the rest of your life and never believe in Jesus. And we're totally fine with that. Why? Because we want you to know there's people that love you for you because that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus didn't love us because we believed in him. He loved us long before we ever believed in him. And so we want to show you there's people that want to do the same thing. We love you where you are. And then from that, here's what's it's awesome is we believe this, that as you see the love of God and as we begin to love, you start to say, you know what? Something is different about this God. You know, it isn't all about a bunch of rules. It isn't all about, it's not like it used to be when I used to go to that. No, it, God, you know what, God, maybe you are real. And we want you to begin to question that. We want you to begin to search that out because the Bible says that as you search, you'll find, as you seek, you'll find. And so here's our heart that you will begin to feel loved and know that you belong. And then from that, you begin to seek God. And we believe this, that you'll find a place where he'll reveal himself to you and I know this that as you believe and as you give your life to him I know this there's no question about it that the heart is always I got I got to do something else I can't just believe in him I want to give my life to him why because I see his goodness in my life religion says behave and then you can believe and then you'll belong Jesus says know this you're loved and you belong And from that, he wants you to see him and his goodness and begin to believe. And then from that, that you would turn and begin to say, I want to become who he's called me to be. And because he died and rose again, this is why we celebrate on Easter. It's not just because we want to eat some Easter eggs. Come on, somebody. It's because here's what it is. We understand because he rose now, we're able to believe in him. He's not just some dead person that we just believe in. No, he's a God that rose that is sitting at the right hand of the Father that can meet us in our baggage and not just leave us in our baggage but remove our baggage and then allow us to become who he's called us and created us to be it's all because he's alive and so today and every day we celebrate the resurrected king amen can we pray today father i thank